What's up, everybody? Six <laughs> thirty. It is indeed six thirty. Damn these Biloxi blues! It happens every night. Air. And I ain't never met a riverboat dealer that could ever be a friend of mine. Nope. Summer heat never treats me kind. It leaves trouble on my mind. So I'm bidding farewell, putting in my notice, and I'll see you at another time. This highway does not know my name, and I don't care. No, I don't care. Headed my way for another place, and I got three good tires. Right to the hook. Just a white line tipsy getting out of Mississippi with just enough gas. Hello, budget live. Actually live from the low budget live bar and grill FBD. Indeed. So I've been, uh, I see some comments here. Welcome to low budget live, by the way, February 25th. My ADD is already kicking in. Uh, I'm seeing some comments about who. You low lifers think it's going to be on the live tonight. And I will tell you, I will tell you, I'm going back through, going back through these. And it is not James Watson, but it was going to be. It was going to be. There's lots going on. I'm going to say that. Uh, I have talked to James today multiple times. We were gonna we were gonna do this. We do have a guest. We do have a guest, and the triple threat uh, hung me out to dry. This is as close to a guest in the studio as we're getting. Little macho man here, uh, but but Watson texted me about fifteen minutes ago that he was he could not come on tonight for some stuff going on. Uh, we'll get into that. He and I he and I are going to get called up here pretty soon. We talked for a long time today, but there's there's some things going on. There's some things going on there uh, in his situation in life. So hope all you're doing well out there. We do have a great guest at uh, in about 30 minutes that's going to join us. So we're going to be, and and it's it's a uh, it's a young man that I've been. Uh, it is it's rich. It's hella bass. It's rich. Uh, we do need to do one, Rich. We got to do one. Uh, but but it's a it's a young man that uh, man I've been keeping up with for a little bit here, and I I'm I'm looking forward to talking to him. I actually had, uh, I actually had him scheduled for an uh, a not so live podcast, okay, and then uh, I went on a bachelor trip. For those of you that saw my announcement today, is uh, I had uh, a crazy time with my buddy Big C. And all the groomsmen that were down there and with us, we went to the beach. We really didn't do anything except consume a lot of uh, alcohol. And buddy, listen, I am I am not. I am too old for all that nonsense. I I got home about last night. Uh, last night about nine o'clock. I am not well. I am not well. So that I didn't get to record a not so live. Uh, and and now here we are going live. So looking forward to it. Lots going on. Uh, this episode is brought to you guys by Fish Tips. Talked about them the other day, Fish Tips. You can get on fishtips.com and you can find you somewhere to go fishing. How about that? Go check them out, fishtips.com. They're going to be presenting some episodes this year. Also got to thank the folks at Gill Fishing, gillfishing.com. You can use the code LBL gift. When you spend a hundred bucks, you get a gift. I mean, it, it's a no brainer. They're going to change those gifts every quarter, but right now it is a reversible beanie at gillfishing.com. Proguybatteries.com. You guys can use the code LBL10 at proguybatteries.com to save you some money there. Proguybatteries.com. Bait-works.com. Bait-wrx. Duncan-10. I hope you're writing all these down. And last but not least, Express Boats, building excitement since 1966. And they don't have a code. They don't have a code. So you can't go buy an Express 
with a code. But I uh, appreciate each and every one of you tuning in tonight. Goodness gracious, the bass fishing world is very, very wild. Uh, very, very wild. <laughs> I just saw a wild comment that I'm going to display for you guys right here. TH Marine on live. I will assure you that's not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, casual bass guy sneaking it in there. Uh, you should, <laughs> here we go. Casual bass guy. I don't know what your real name is, buddy, but you are killing it. You should have an LVS 34 on one of these nights. It's won so many turns. <laughs> yeah. Here is, uh, so I would, let's get into that. Let's get into, let's get into some forward facing sonar. I want to hear it in the comments. What do you, what do you think? Where are we at? Where are we at as a fan base? Because I know what I see. I see the squeaky wheels, right? And if there's some of y'all that are squeaky wheels, that's fine. But I'm saying I think the squeaky wheels, I say it every week on the podcast, I feel like the squeaky wheels are always going to be the loudest, right? I want to start with this. I think, I think fishing, I get to watch more of it than anybody uh, or as much as anybody does with live coverage with MPFL. And I'll just tell you right now, fishing's boring Other to watch other than just fleeting moments of excitement. So the argument that forward-facing sonar live is boring doesn't, it just doesn't compute with me because I've watched guys, you know, back in the day, dragging a Carolina rig, throwing a big worm. That sucks to watch too. Watching a guy ledge fish 10 years ago also sucked unless he got on like a big flurry or whatever. And it's a lot of action, but I, I think Ronnie Moore said it best on here. The problem I think we do have all of us as fans, or if you're working in the industry is live coverage has extended this for hours. So you get to, you consume so much more of it than those 45 minute to an hour shows where everything's edited. Bam, 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 bam. Right. I think if that was the case, people wouldn't be bitching as much. Maybe. Um, but I do think I like, I I've said it, if, if it's pro level, like entertain me, right. I like seeing eight pounders get called. Do I also like to see people flipping bushes and throwing spinnerbaits? Million percent. I just, I'm a bass fishing nerd. I have been since I was 10 years old, man. I'm an addict. I love it. So we'll just see, um, We'll just see where all this is headed, man. I don't think, it, from my opinion, I do not think it will be banned by an organization. I do not. I think that you could see them limit transducers. But I do think, I do think you could see it change if, and only if, and I think maybe I've said this on the show or I've said it on some show that I've done, um, is... Unless a state bans it, right? Like if you take a state like Texas and they're biologists and whatever, and they deem that it's bad for a fishery or fisheries in a in a big time tournament state, a South Carolina, a Florida, a Texas, a, an Alabama, Tennessee, whatever, they ban it, then you would see the tournament organizations make a move, I think. But I think as long as it is legal, as long as it is legal, they're going to allow it. The electronics companies have a lot of money in, invested in tournament fishing. You guys know this. And I just don't think it's going anywhere. For me, I think it's incredible what we're learning about bass. Like, that's the part that I think that while everybody's pissing and moaning, you're losing sight in, like, we couldn't do this. These tournaments would have gone totally different 10 years ago. And we're just learning where they're at. And where they've been for so, so long, it's it's incredible to me. I don't know. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. Like I, I kind of stay, I float around. Like, I am an old school dude, but I also like to live scope. Like, I enjoy doing it. And I do enjoy now that, like, with MPFL, what we started last fall, that now everybody's doing the split screen with the, with the live sonar showing that. Dude, it's fun to watch. Like, I, if you don't get riled up about a bait dropping down to a big one and old boy setting the hook, I don't know. That gets me all fired up. So uh, it is indeed a new world, though. I think everything changes. I was talking to uh, to my buddy Justin Martin today about this a little bit. And, you know, him him being on that hunting in industry side, I hadn't thought about this. He was talking about some of the uh, like the 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 decoys that that move. 
And when that came out into the duck hunting world, it was just like Katie bar the door. Everybody was going to burn it down, but it was so long ago. You didn't have social media for people, you know, to make videos or to make comments and things about. So I, I find that interesting. I, I think that the same reaction could have happened when side imaging came out. Had there been social media, I think that, that it definitely could have happened. I've mentioned this several times when the, uh, when like David Fritz started smashing them offshore with the, uh, <laughs> with a flasher, but he was just a little bit ahead of everybody else on it. And I think you probably had guys that would have definitely typed in the comments then, but, uh, I don't know, man, I don't think, I think the, the viewpoint that the take that they're losing viewers, dude, that ain't happening. It's just not happening. If they were, they would do something about it. And, and I say they, MPFL included in that. Viewership's going up. It's going up. So I, I don't uh, I don't know. I don't know where all of it's headed. Again, I'm going to go through some comments. Fishing with Bam, who makes some great videos. Y'all go follow Fishing with Bam on Instagram. He, he cracks me up on a daily basis. Toledo Bam was fun to watch. I thought it was, too. I got to watch some of it coming home yesterday. I was hungover. Uh, but I was flipping back and forth between it and MLF, pulling for my boy Watson, my boy Wiggins over there. Um, so I, I saw there was one, there was a comment here, guys, <laughs> Corey Williams, <laughs> everybody go tell big C that you can't believe he's getting married. Big C is in the comments right now. We're really, we're all proud that he's getting married because we had questions for years, but now those are being solved. He's marrying his beautiful bride, April the 6th. And I'm still hung over because of a weekend with him and all his crazy friends. There was a comment I saw oh, right there. Hella bass rich. There's no skill in fishing anymore is the worst take. And I, I do agree with that a million percent. Like that is such a terrible take. When you read that, man, you are being beyond disrespectful to the people that it, like a hundred of these guys out there on the elites, 150, uh, or 120 in the MPFL, 80 in the BPT. They've all got it. They've all got it. They've all got it. And and as I've joked many times, like, if it's that easy, why is it not a 100-way tie or 120-way tie for first place? Why are they all not just catching giants all the time? There is a significant difference between the ones that are catching them with and the ones that, that are just casually trying it. And I think it's a commitment level thing to it. And I have nothing but respect for, hey, go do it. If that's what's paying the bills, don't go to the bank. If you're better at that than you are anything else, then go do it. And, and as long as it's allowed, you're stupid if you don't go do it, especially if you're fishing professionally. I've also said this, though, and I mean this as much as anything I've ever said. Bass fishing is it's so much fun, man. It's so much fun. We like to talk crap about it here, the, the business of it on the show. There's some drama in there, whatnot, obviously. But fishing at its core, like what attracted me to it, it's it's so much fun. So whatever makes it fun for you to go do, like when you get a day off to go bass fishing, go do that. Whatever the case is. You want to go throw a shaky head all day? Go do that. You want to four-face and sonar until your eyes are crossed and, you're, and you got tech neck, as Justin Lucas calls it? Go do it. Go do it. Uh, but if you want to be John Cox and go throw a wacky worm and a, and a chatterbait everywhere, do it. Do it. Uh, Nick Bowen fishing. NPFL could steal the show going no forward-facing sonar. See, I, I don't – and, Nick, I I, I appreciate that, uh, the comment. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't – I think that it would be – I think that's a little too gimmicky. I actually had a, uh, a conversation with NPFL president brad fuller today we talked about this subject and and you know woody you know what do you think now do i think there's a possibility you could do a one-off event without it yeah but you better be on some lake that's on fire that that you because then you're gonna have five hours of coverage that could potentially suck um uh, i don't know I, I don't but i don't think that necessarily would like put them over the top if they were the ones now would all the people that piss and moan about it show up probably probably but i think a lot of them are watching anyways 
I, I made a uh, I made a video this weekend, just like a little meme deal about the guy that's commenting that viewership's down and you know that it's all you know fishing's over and he's never watching live fish again as he's watching live fishing because I think that's what you get a lot, man. Um, Mark Shannon, keep it out of professional fishing. I just I don't I don't know. That's another take that I don't think I, I and not to pick on you, Mark, at all, buddy. Uh, I think that's a weird take for me too, because I don't know why the pros shouldn't be allowed to use it. I, I don't, I don't, they've got two and a half days to break down a gigantic body of water like Toledo Bend. Why are they, why are they, you know, supposed to be handcuffed, but then us regular Joes could go use LifeScope like that. That's, I don't, I don't get that. I see a lot of that. I do. I see a lot of comments about keep it out of pro fishing. Keep it out of pro fishing. I just, I don't know, or this isn't pro fishing. This is video gaming. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. Travis T in the comments. I'm, I'm, I'm catching up. I'm way behind here. Can we talk about Jordan Lee walking back into the elites like he never left? That dude is scary. Listen, if anybody, and I, I did see, I did see a guy that's like a super MLF fan in some comments on Facebook as I was riding down the road, just like he, screenshot a picture of Joe Lee's first five in the boat. And it was like eight pounds. He's like, well, it looks like, looks like he should have stayed at MLF. And I was like, buddy, I bet that sucked for you at the end of the week. <laughs> hoping that guy, hoping that guy didn't catch him. Dude, he's always going to catch him. Joe Lee is the freaking man. I saw he went up there poking around shallow yesterday before it was all over. Um, let's see here. It's Sega Genesis. Hey, don't be hating on Sega Genesis, dude. I will still play NBA Jam on Sega Genesis if I could find with find one right now. <laughs> Reed, anyone bitching out there want to sell me one? <laughs> oh, me. Y'all crack me up. Low lifers in full force. I think it would be cool to see the opens not have forward facing sonar. And if you qualify for the leads, do whatever you want. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Could be interesting. Could be interesting. I do think my microphone sounds, my microphone sounds like crap. I know that. Uh, Mike Cable. I do think that they should just, I, I, I've seen some comments on that. They should bring back the Alabama rig because let's be honest. Let's be honest. Like if we can't throw the damn a rig, but we can forward face and son sonar them with the little manner, you know. I, I think we ought to be able to throw the a rig too. Let's just let's just pull the damn train wheels off this thing. Let's full send it. Let's see some fifty pound bags. There we go. Get rid of. Let them use nets. Here we go. Bring back the a rig. Get rid of all boat restrictions. Let them use net. Dude, I'm here for it. Let them put a four fifty on those suckers. Let's go. Let's see who's got the. The guts to hang that on the back of the the old bass boat. I know Bass Cat's doing some of that. Just because the pros do it doesn't mean everyone else have to do it. Jay, Jordan Lee had a basic setup and still made the top ten. That that's something else, you know. Limiting it because I know Koya. Shout out to Koya for winning that Fujita. I think he's got five live scopes. Like that's a little bananas for me. It's what he does. It's super cool to watch him smash because. He definitely does that. But Patrick Walters is one of the most dangerous anglers on the planet, period, in the story. Started his year with another top 10 on the Elite Series. He's got one transducer. That's it. One. One. One up front. So, I don't know. Um, I do kind of – I kind of would like to see him use Nats again, too. I would school you, <laughs> Bo. You settle down, Bo. <laughs> school me on NBA Jam, he says. Watch Chris Tal Zane's video about the cost elite sonar setups, most for thirty thousand to fifty thousand. Yeah, I mean that's 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 true. So this year, I can I can tell you from my experience alone. You know, I am uh, I, I was sponsored by Garmin for very many years, and my deal with them changed a little bit this year. So I'm running a mix, and and uh, and I know poor me, uh, but I did. I got I got my electronics like i did get my product from 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 them for many years and this year run a little bit different setup i got a couple of rances i've got to do a boat walkthrough video I haven't done that uh, but i've got a uh 
I've got a couple of ranches and I and I am running Garmin LiveScope, running a power pole trolling motor. I paid for all of it. And uh, just so I can try to see what I like, what I don't like. And dude, even that, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have some folks that'll cut me a break on stuff, but I'll just tell you right now, it ain't cheap. And I've always obviously known that even when I was getting things like electronics are not cheap. So I, I understand it completely, completely understand um, that, that the cost is just getting out of hand. I mean, the boat, the boat price base boat price alone right now is six figures on a bass boat. It's crazy. I never thought that I, I never thought I would see that in my life, but it's just, you know, it's, it's where we are, unfortunately on everything. And I do, I would like to see that go back the other way. Um, where's fat cat? Nick says, uh, probably in bed right now on Eastern time. <laughs> to be, uh, my, Big C is in the comments and texting me right now. So, um, 100 pounds forward facing sonar is better than 60 pounds no live scope. How's Lake Teresa? Lake Teresa, I got to do an update video. I'm sorry. Everybody, y'all ask that a lot and I apologize. Lake Teresa, I got to get out there. I got to get out there. It does have bass in it. I do want to go do a video. I may go out there this week. Have not been in out there in forever. Who's my pick for the classic? Ronnie Moore and I talked about that a little bit last week. My pick, I can't remember who I picked. I think it's going to be very hard to I'm gonna be honest with you, I think it's hard to pick against Ben Milliken in that. I really do, man. I really do. Uh obviously Jason Christie is very, very, very like the obvious pick there. I think a guy like Luke Palmer could be dangerous there. He's again top 10. That dude fishing out of his mind. There's just so many. I think Patrick Walters there. It's uh that's gonna be a fun one. That's going to be a fun one, depending on the weather and all that. But man, dude, I don't know. Like I, and I've ate crow on this because I said Ben Milliken would never, ever, ever be uh, a pro. Uh, not Ben in particular, I guess, but like YouTubers, I said that would never happen, right? And dude, it's uh, it's pretty damn crazy what he's doing right now. What he has done to walk through the opens was incredible. To come out swinging first elite, yeah, I know he knows to lead a bin, and that's that's close to home. But dude, just the pressure alone, it's it's pretty freaking amazing. It's it's pretty dang amazing. So props to him. Like that's uh that's crazy. Is is Fat Todd in the comments? Is that what I'm seeing? To me and Patrick Walter share shorty shorts. No, I got I I I got a, a lot more on. Uh, Patrick and the my dad bod department. I can't I can't wear that. I am. I'm gonna do something real quick. Y'all give me two seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna, let's see what happens here. I I am sending a uh <laughs> I'm sending a guest, a potential guest, a uh what did what is this, Michael? Who made me shut my mouth? No. Who made me shut my mouth? Michael Shears made me shut you you are mouth. I don't know what that means. Uh band fishing poles. Stick your head in the water. <laughs> Let's see. I'm texting a guest, potential guest. I, I am, uh, Ben made me shut my mouth. No, Ben didn't make me shut my mouth. I, I am as a man saying that I was wrong about that, but he didn't make me shut my mouth, Michael. Um, big Ben. No, oh, okay. That's, you must be a, an mf -er. There you go, bud. Uh, whoever would have thought forward facing would win Santee. Yeah, that would, that was crazy. Shout out to Jacob. Uh, congrats to Jacob on yet another win they're going to go to uh they're going to have to ban forget four faces on our band jacob and dustin connell <laughs> major league fishing it's uh it's it's bananas at this point what's happening but i really did like dean rojas gave him a run my, my old buddy jesse wiggins was in the mix for a while too so uh i thought that was a pretty cool old school tournament i know watson was catching on a spinnerbait one of the things that we were hoping that he uh he was going to come on here and talk about today. 
uh, um, you know, he's uh, he's going through it right now. I'll just throw that out there. He's going through it out there. We do have a guest in five minutes. I did line up another one. I think it's around 730. So in 30 minutes, low lifers, <laughs> Mike Oz is giving you crap. Giving you crap. What's up, low lifers? Fellow low lifers, Joe Brando. Shout out to Watson for the top 10, no doubt. And shout out to Watson for just like being James. Can we say that? Can we say that? Like in a world that is so PC at times, just shout out to him for, for just being himself and uh, and then getting it done, man. I was hoping to see him win. Like that's the friend in me. That's the fan in me. Like I, I can't, uh, I truly, I was disappointed for him i was absolutely disappointed but he uh he had a great event man and and I, and he needed it he definitely needed it all right we've got a guy waiting in the wings and we may just go ahead just just jump to this young man so i am i am absolutely a fan of this guy all right i i have to open up by saying i don't i don't know him that well we've been we've been messaging back and forth and I think he's a perfect guest for everything going on right now. Coming off of a little bit uncharacteristically tough tournament for him at Santee Cooper. But he's going to join us. We're going to bring him in right now, ladies and gentlemen. Drew Gill. Nothing like putting you right on the spot, buddy. How are you? Uh-oh. Hang on a second. Now can yeah. I hear? You? Yeah, I got yeah. you in there now. You were muted. I'm, you're in here now, <laughs> Drew Gill, winner of Sam Rayburn in the Tackle Warehouse Invitationals, rookie on the Bass Pro Tour. I, if you don't know this name in bass fishing, you are not paying attention right now. Drew, thanks for joining me, buddy. I appreciate you, Luke. And uh, just wrapped up the first day of practice for my next tournament. Man, it's been uh, fishing or driving for the last month and a half for me. And uh, two tournaments left before that's not the case. So it's uh. It's it's full time, man. But I I couldn't be loving it more than I am right now, for sure. I, I was gonna say now you're now you're down at West Point, right? That's the, <clears throat> yep. the latest. Yep, I'm down here at West Point, and uh, this is a unique place. Uh, I I I don't want to offend the lake too much by calling it more <laughs> than a unique place. Um, there's not many lakes that set up like this one at this time of year that have as poor of weights as this fishery has, and uh, so it's it's gonna be an interesting tournament. I think it's gonna be extremely interesting. Man, that lake I fished an Everstart there many moons ago. It's the only time I've ever been there, and it is a unique. It is a unique fishery. It's a beautiful lake. It's got some big fish in it, but it fishes kind of scattered, if that makes sense from a weight perspective. I feel like, and and it seems like it's you know you follows right up up the road or down the road, one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's right there, and as that lake has seems like it's kind of been on an uptick weight wise over the years. West Point just never really gets there. I thought it was a cool move though by MLF to put that on the invitational schedule. I liked, I like seeing the diversity and going to West point, but you think it's going to be a little grimy. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I mean, you look at the weights from the last couple of years here, this time of year, like you'll see the top end, there will be a 20 bag or two and big bass is almost always over seven, but then you get, you get 10 spots down and it's like 13 pounds. You get to the middle of the field and it's like eight. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an interesting fishery. And the fact that it's sandwiched between, yes, I know there's one or two other impoundments below it, but like it's between Lanier and Eufaula and it's this <laughs> bad. Yeah. Like it's, it's pretty remarkable. And it, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the comp or the uh, competing predator population. I mean, there's within 360 degrees of you on this lake at any given time, you can catch a striper. Like as fast as you can That's throw, crazy. you can catch a striper in this lake. I, I kid you not, this is not like an inflated number. If you were throwing a casting rod and you're able to reel them up fast, you could probably catch 150 to 200 stripers a day. On this oh, like it's unbelievable. Ones. Do what? Like big ones. Like big dude, all sizes. There's white hybrids and stripes. The biggest one I caught today was close to 20 pounds, but I caught a couple stripers today that may not have made two pounds. I mean, it's so, it's unbelievable. So let's <laughs> let's talk about this then in this forward facing sonar world, and you were as dialed as any. <laughs> I, mean, I saw a little bit about what you did with uh, Panger on BTL. I saw uh, some of your clips from Bass U. You are dialed. To say you are dialed is really an understatement. It's not fair to you in my opinion <clears throat> on that. So with that being said, that's what you enjoy doing. It's what you're 
you're great at, but is that does that make it more uh, like a, a challenge I guess, <clears throat> with all of the uh, quote trash fish swimming around? I mean, I know you know the difference, but what will that do this week with that many stripers around? I mean, so basically what happens is it, <clears throat> this might not be the case for everybody, but in my opinion, this is the case for 99% of us. I'm lumping myself in this category too, which is whenever you have a large population of competing predatory fish like catfish or stripes that generally are about the same profile as a bass and they all fall in the same size category as bass. So we're talking about that two to six pound range. And mm-hmm. if you have those predatory fish in that size range and they set up as singles rather than groups, you pretty much got to throw away the whole idea of catching them suspended, um, which is what we're running into this week. I mean, I legit picked through probably 60 something of them this morning uh, between white bass, crappie, stripes, hybrids, and caught one spotted bass. It was two and a half pounds and that was it. Like Ooh. it's just so inefficient and uh, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty crazy um, getting into those scenarios. Like there's probably somebody out there, you know, that, that are, you know, like a, like a Koya or a, or a <clears throat> Wheeler, or a lot of other guys that spend so much time on it that they can tell. But personally, when I get around a bunch of single stripes and catfish that are three to six pounds, I, I can't tell. And I, I have to really? kind of throw the whole deal when they're singles, when they're singles, it is so hard to tell because it, a single striper acts so much like a bass. The only difference is like when a striper decides not to eat your bait, it kind of bolts off really fast. But, yeah, uh, really fast. but <clears throat> Other than that, man, it's it's really hard to tell in these scenarios. And like, if it was a different ratio, like if we're talking like even seventy five twenty five, and you can just say screw it and pick through them, it's fine. But uh, I generally, when I get in a place with that has this high of a predatory population that's not bass, uh, generally I'm going to try and get around the target, and that's what I'm going to do this week at West Point. Is like if you can get around the target where you can make those fish relate to it in a certain way, where you can read how they're relating to the target to decide if they're bass. It's just like a it's not just about profile and size at that point. It's also about profile size and how they relate to cover, which is an additional variable that you can input that essentially makes it, you know, a little bit more refined as to what you're dealing with. Buddy, you are, you are dialed. I'm going to say that one more time for the folks at home listening, be taking, I'm over here taking notes. I'm trying to take notes. This young man, uh, that that was amazing right there. And also Michelle Thomason in the comments says, How are you not sponsored by Gill Apparel? And I and I am I have a partnership with Gill and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a phone call, Drew. You may have a other sponsor, but that doesn't even make sense. I don't care who it is. If it's not Gill, it doesn't make sense for me, buddy. <laughs> I uh, I work with uh hook gear on my apparel. Okay. They've done a great job supporting me, but I I uh, I really appreciate the comment. <laughs> you know, that's, that's funny. That's funny. Hook <clears throat> You've been warned. Gill's coming after the Gill's coming after Gill. Okay. It's happening. Uh, absolutely happening. Also, Mark McQua, Drew Gill is my hero in the comments. Mark McQua is my hero. Mark is, is everybody's hero, I'm pretty sure. He's I, the best. If, if Mark's not somebody's hero, I'd be I'd be really it's not even like a, a a wow, you know, what's the ethical judgment on Mark? It's an ethical judgment on that person. No doubt. Not liking Mark. <laughs> yeah. No <laughs> doubt about it, man. No doubt about it. So, all right, let's get back to this. Let's get back to this forward facing sonar talk. So I know you see all of the, the craziness online, right? And you've got a job to do on the water. So you're probably not at it as much as the rest of us goofballs that have all the time in the world uh, to be on social media. But what, what's your take on it though? What is your take on? I mean, obviously you're a fan of it. You're very, you you love it, but what's your take on the, uh, the social media hot takes on social media. What's your take on that, Drew? I mean, really, there's two angles to it. So basically, everyone that that talks on social media about how they feel about forward-facing sonar either takes the, I really don't like watching it angle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cheating angle. Those are the two angles. And so, you know, the first one to address is the, the spotlighting cheating situation is basically what we're dealing with is a misunderstanding of the technology. So <clears throat> when you use this technology over and over and over again, and you interact with all these fish in their natural environments, it is a col- it's an information collection device. It allows you to know the fact of every scenario that you're in all day long, every day you go fishing. All it is, it's a fax machine. I, I say fax machine, you know, as a, as a pun, but that's what it is. Uh, it allows you to know all of the information of the areas that you're in at all times, and it allows you to make educated decisions. So basically, I am truly learning 
we could not truly learn in a controlled sense before forward facing sonar because you didn't have the ability to control the experiment. It's like a scientist trying to make an experiment on anything in a lab, but in the lab, they've got a dog chasing a cat, chasing a mouse, running around, disturbing things all the time. I mean, when you have all of these variables that are outside of your control that you can't perceive, you cannot truly learn in an organized fashion, which, you know, growing up in Illinois and not fishing tournaments from the age of four, I was behind the eight ball really bad in terms of catching up to everybody tournament fishing wise. But through putting the time in and watching fish and fish interactions with their environment, with forage, with the contours they relate to with my bait, I was able to really quickly surmise how fish relate to things different times of year on different pieces of cover and things like that. <clears throat> and I mean, it was just the ability to quickly understand what's going on. And like the idea that it's not, it's not skill-based is contrary to what we've seen the last three or four years. Cause <laughs> what have we noticed with the top of the sport over the last three or four years, the top of the sport has gone from great to unbeatable there's a difference between great and unbeatable in in everyone i say everyone 99 percent of professional anglers have this technology on their boats the difference is how these anglers utilize it to take in the information around them even if they're not directly using it to catch every single fish they see this technology is playing in the best of the best hands like the guys that are dominating everyone all the time and make me feel bad about myself as an angler to have a 43rd place (laughs) finish um these guys that are dominating us every single tournament, people like to throw the easy, the easy answer of they're just getting some sort of information and that's why they're better than me. Because it's, it's easy to stomach at that point. It's, a, it's an ethical pill that I can take and say I'm just more ethical than someone else. When in actuality, the issue is, is they are better at understanding what they're around than you are and they are better at collecting all this information in a rapid rate and understanding what it means. And that is why the guys that have been great, you know, we, we had obviously had good, great, fantastic anglers before forward facing sonar. We didn't have untouchable anglers until forward facing sonar. We didn't have guys that physically could not be beat. Everyone had it. It was just fishing before forward facing sonar. We could use it's just fishing because twice a year, every one of these anglers would truly fail. They would have a poor tournament that doesn't happen anymore. So that's, there's the skill argument right there is like, that's out of the window. It's impossible to make a skill argument on forward-facing sonar because the same guys beat everyone with it. Period, end of story. And they they were beating them without it, right? And if you take it away tomorrow, they're still going to. And there's a comment that came in, and this is, and this, I want to put this up here. Uh, This casual bass guy, he's had some good comments tonight. Can you remember the last time you did good in a tournament without live scope? And, and, and I I only put that up there for this reason. I think that is a, I see that take a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but like you're saying, I feel like if you took it away, you still understand more about bass in my opinion than I do in my 40 year old, you know, 40 years on this earth bass fishing for 30 years. I feel like you understand them because of your hours with forward facing way more than I might ever. That was believe it. That is hitting the nail on the head perfectly. Because here's the thing you take forward facing sonar away. So many of these commenters say you take forward facing sonar away, and a lot of your anglers that are doing decent will do better and your best will drop down. The opposite will happen. The ones that are doing decent will do worse. And the ones that are doing the best, their best is going to look better. Because even without using the technology, they understand the behaviors because of using the technology. So now we know true cold, hard facts about bass behavior. We didn't before. We do now. And you can still operate on those facts whether you're using the technology actively or not. I will say this, though. There is an element that is the separating factor between a lot of your high-level anglers that are very good at being consistent and consistently around fish and your guys that are impeccable. Your guys that are really good forward-facing sonar anglers that are always around fish always do well because they're always around a population. Right. But you have a group of anglers that is not just impeccable at being around a great population, but they're impeccable at catching them. And when you take forward-facing sonar away, you do take away the ability to dial it into the nth degree. So your, your unbelievable anglers are still unbelievable. You know, that shifts, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. As soon as you shift that down, everybody shifts down. But the thing is, is you're impeccable anglers. Part of it is because they spend enough time watching fish interactions and behavior that they can read a fish 60 feet away from their boat, 
interacting with a bait and know exactly what movement they need to make with that presentation right then, or whether they need to just burn it up and grab another rod and throw a different technique at them, a technique they haven't even thrown up to that point, and they know they can catch that fish on it because of the way it's interacted with their bait. And that is something you don't get without thousands of hours of study and understanding with this technology. No doubt about it. And, and I'm a sight fisherman. I say that a lot on the show. It's my favorite. I like to, I like to sight fish. I like to bed fish. A lot of people hate it. They, you know, you get a lot of arguments about that, but it, to me, it is that it's those hours and hours and hours and hours. When I pull up on one, I'm like, okay, it's catchable. It's not, especially mm-hmm. after a couple pitches, how it reacts to a bait. And it, it's amazing to me doing MPFL live. I got to spend a lot of time with Patrick Walters last year over his shoulder, you know, mm-hmm. And to watch his decision-making process on what he would throw at them based on what he was seeing on the screen, it's it's crazy, man. Like, there's a level of dialed like you're talking about with the guys that are separating themselves from the pack at the professional level. They were doing it before, but now they're doing it, like you said, they're almost untouchable, or so it seems. And Patrick's one of those guys to me. Yeah, 100%. Uh, but, 100%. But it is, it is, it's not just, oh, there's a dot, I throw at it, they bite, I put them in the live well, I go back and, and high-five the, uh, the tournament MC and collect my check. It's certainly not that. Uh, Ron Cliff <laughs> said, I love this guy, but Gil, Drew Gill is a 60-year-old scientist uh, presented in a 30-something body. And you know, I don't, he's not 30, Ron. How old are you, Drew? I'm, I'm 21. 21! <laughs> Come on, come on, Ron. You put some you put some age on Drew here. He's a 21-year-old. I still appreciate the compliment. Yeah, no, no doubt, no, no doubt about it. Uh so do you approach every event saying I'm only going to utilize forward facing sonar? I mean, do you say they're on the bed? I mean, obviously, I know they're you can see them on that as well. We're starting to see shallow scoping. <laughs> play more and more and more but do you ever have a day on the water where you go eh, just gonna go throw a buzz bait down the bank <laughs> does drew gill like to do that based on okay. all the knowledge you have or what what so, do you do if the boat comes off the trailer what are you doing this is story time right here okay you, uh, you word for word just said what so you look at my season i had last year on the invitations i finished ninth in our points mm-hmm. i had three top tens another check adjustments check and a 110th place finish the 110th place finish, I went to Clarks Hill. I went to Clarks Hill Lake in March, which is a place where, like, people are like, oh, yeah, now you're back in your zone after Okeechobee. This is what you want to do. And I went up the river one day in practice, and it was, like, brick orange water. The bushes were in the water. It was 71 degrees and sunny, and I picked up a black buzz bait, and I burned them down. Okay. <laughs> And I said, I'm shutting it off. I'm not in it. It wasn't like I used it to just like see what was around me and pick my target. Signal. I shut it off. I was like, I'm just going to shut it off. I'm going to just go fishing. And turns out I was fishing in the really dirty water. So you couldn't notice this up there without, you know, some sort of assistance down Lake in the middle of the tournament. There was a, there was a turn and a lot of people started catching them off bed. John Cox had a kind of mediocre first day, smoked him the second day. Keith, mediocre first day, mm-hmm. smoked him the second day. Ron Nelson, smokes him the second day. All the sight fishermen just pop off at once down lake. I'm up lake in the dirty water, and I wasn't paying attention to my forward-facing sonar. They all, like, it was one of the hardest and most aggressive, like, jumps from they being went. on the bank to being on bed yeah. that I've ever seen. And I, I just totally shut myself off from that info. Even though I was still going to fish that same area in a very similar way, I wasn't going to fish it exactly the same way because they they all got on bit. If I'd had it on, I would have noticed it, but I didn't. I went to the next event, you follow Oklahoma, and I was like, I'm putting it on and I'm going to use it to collect as much information about what I'm doing as possible. Even if it doesn't decide how I fish, I'm going to watch every cast I make all day. I'm going to, everything that I look at all day, I'm going to look at it. You know, everything I go past, I'm going to look at it. And you follow Oklahoma, I end up finding them on bed on forward facing sonar and finished second in that event to Kelly Jordan. Um, and that was kind of the event that was turning point for me. That was like, this isn't about trying to just offshore fish in every tournament. This is about using the technology to understand. This is purely about collecting information on what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. And ever since then, I have used it for every cast in every tournament since not necessarily just to like go, Oh, 
you know, there's a fish. Let me throw at it 75 feet away with my with my jig head minnow and just reel it over its head. Watch it come up and eat it. <laughs> Although I have done a little bit of that, yes. Um, <laughs> that's not really what it looks like. Like in a vacuum, we like to go live scope, offshore fishing, offshore fishing, live scope, and that is not the case at all, man. It's a, it's an absolutely indispensable tool for just understanding the scenario you're in. You know, it's it's a great tool for turning follows into bites around the bank it's a great tool for like it's santee not a sterling example because i had a mediocre tournament <laughs> but i will say this i saw i saw 18 bass over the course of the tournament boated 14 of them I saw 18 bass i was fishing cypress street single cypress street and i tried to fight it out up lake i didn't do a very good job of it but <clears throat> saw 18 fish over two days got every single one of those 18 fish to bite boated 14 if I was not using it, I would not have gotten but probably a third of those fish to even eat my bait because I was having to truly dissect where on the tree they wanted to position and pitch a bait at them that was, that was right. And if I did that and I snuck up on them, didn't alert them in my boat presence, I was able to get every single one of those fish to bite if I wanted to get it to bite. And like, you know, that's the difference between knowing and guessing. And we used to guess for a long time. You know, I didn't obviously fish at this level on the guessing side of things ever but i fish obviously i grew up fishing without forward facing sonar and like there were so many variables we just didn't have access to and we couldn't make accurate adjustments we had to make a lot of a lot of micro adjustments and somewhere along the line we hit but we didn't know why we hit it was like it's like battleship you start you start throwing out numbers eventually you hit but you don't know whether it's the front of the ship the back of the ship you don't know whether the ship is facing this way or this way you just know you got to hit you know that somewhere around there, you did something right, but you don't know exactly what you did right. And so it's a lot longer process. And we can now we can fish, you know, it, let's say what took us four hours back in the day to dissect an area from start to finish with multiple different presentations at multiple different parts of the water column in one little part of the lake. Might have taken us four or five hours previously. Now it takes us 45 minutes. And so I'm fishing in, let's say, one day of practice. Let's say I'm fishing five times more efficiently than we used to. I am fishing five days of old school practice in one day. By the end of three days of practice, I'm fishing 15 days of old school practice in three days. How on earth, it, when you look at that and you look at the way that, that this technology exposes the bass population and shows us so many little intricacies that we didn't previously understand, can you look at it and say, it's not a skill issue. It's, it's an unbelievable piece of technology. And like, you know, love it or hate it, whether you enjoy using it or not, the objective fact is that it allows us to interact with the population and truly understand the behavior of the species in a way we never could before. We are understanding bass. We aren't just guessing or being really good at at kind of roundabout getting our way to something of what they're doing. We now truly understand where they go. We are finding it like A perfect example was that Toyota championship we fished at Gunnersville two years ago in the fall. Gunnersville in the fall was always a frogging, flipping, go out there, fight it out, grind it out tournament. And we went there and ended up stumbling on that deal. And me and Marshall and Kyle Hall caught, you know, it was one of those 18 to 20 pounds a day kind of events where you could do no wrong because we learned how to find the population. And that was impossible before. And now we have the ability to truly understand our fisheries 365 days a year. And that's something that's in my mind, is just totally magical. It is. And, and for, I think a lot of the, the issue we're seeing, and I'm seeing comments, you know, Mark Shannon here, throw a coal net, throw a net and coal the net instead of your live well, it's not fishing. Uh, it, it is fishing. I can't, I can't agree with that kind of stuff. I think for me, and, and where a lot of this stuff I think stems from is we are di- guys like you and others that are very good at it. Uh, I, I talked about this from the Alabama bass trail a couple weeks ago, mm. which you guys are disproving is every dang thing that we thought these fish did forever. And now we're like, wait a second. They never did this. Uh, take Pickwick. For example, when we have an extreme amount of current, it has been known my entire life. They have to get behind something. 
bank. They are going to go to the bank. They're going to get behind a rock pile. Well, buddy, I did the Alabama Bass Trail down there two weeks ago. The current was ripping. The water was high. And three out of the top five bags were caught in the middle of the river scoping those fish and the bait fish that we thought, oh, well, those little bait fish can't swim in that. They've got to go to the bank. Nope, they were all out in the middle of the river channel. All we saw that happen with the Toyota that Hayden Marbot won a couple weeks ago at Gunnersville. Yep. Uh, it was flowing hard, dirty, and just the current was getting it, and he's out there in the river channel scoping them. I mean, and the thing is, like, the, the, you look at that and you're like, oh, my goodness, you know, they're just catching what we'll call cheater fish. No, we're understanding where the population that we didn't understand goes. And, like, the problem is, is like, at what point do we pump the brakes mentally and say, we've learned enough, we, we know enough, that's – we that's i'm okay with only knowing half of the information like that's when we hit the brakes and we say okay swing trainers in major league baseball you cannot watch these videos in slow motion and break down this guy's swing at a minute level he swings good enough we don't want to have to put in the extra time and effort to break down this swing at an analytical level we just want to go up there and we want to take hacks because taking hacks is fun I love taking hacks as much as anybody else. You go out there, you throw me 50 mile an hour fastballs and let me take batting practice for two hours. I'm having a blast. But guess what? Does that always make you better at understanding, you know, how to, how to hit at a, at a major league level, how to, how to read pitches out of somebody's hand at 95 miles an hour? No, it does. It's fun. It's enjoyable. It's, it's my favorite version of it as, as just a person. But in terms of truly getting better and understanding the way that you do things, if you just pump the brakes on progress and mental progress, the ability to learn and, and progress, essentially what you're saying is this sport that we call a sport, really we only want it to be competitive to an extent. There's an extent where we want it to be – like I love fun fishing as much as the next guy. I fun fish all the time. I love catching bass. But there's a difference between fun fishing and competitive fishing. And ultimately, with competitive fishing, our goal is to be the best that we can be understand as much as we can understand and truly make the best the best and without facts and understanding the best can only reach such a level now that we have facts and understanding it is truly driven by individuals taking the time to be extremely analytical about what they're doing and face the facts rather than just doing what we've always wanted to do and like regardless of how we want to fish Ultimately, if you just want to fish one way all the time and you just want to do your thing because it's your thing, what you're doing is you are essentially shutting yourself off and saying, I'm going to be less diverse than I have to be or less understanding than I have to be. And I'm okay with not having all the facts if it allows me to do what I want to do. And from my perspective as a competitive tournament angler, like that's, that is contrary to the, you know, you look at, at what Aaron did for so long. It was the definition of detail and, and diversity. He won tournaments or did had insanely high finishes doing so many different things because Aaron took the time, even before the technology, to dial in the detail of what he was doing to the nth degree every single time. Every piece of information that he could collect that would make his game more refined, it he did it. He was extreme. Like everybody talks about how extremely detail oriented he was, and and back then, you know, we were admired Aaron for that and now when individuals are extremely detail oriented and analytical and have the facts that allow them to do so somehow it's cheating because they're that freaking good at reading that information and, and Aaron was one of those guys ahead of his time right he was on side imaging before so many were he was so great with that. 2d and then but just re, like you're saying but refining the the techniques to be able to catch those bass that he was seeing and he could also beat you with a flipping stick, though, right? 100%. Have it yeah, same deal. That was that was Aaron all the way around, and and that's such a great point, man. And I, I think the arguments that I don't like are well, these young kids, young kids, young kids, young kids. I saw somebody say, man, if somebody, uh, everybody in the top fifty at the Bassmaster Elite Series was born in the nineties. We're also the same people that say we want to grow the sport. We're going to grow the sport. Let's grow the sport, but let's not let youth come into the sport right all at the same time because for me i've got a i've got a house full of full of boys here and if my 16 year old sees a 21 year old drew gill out there smashing at the professional level 
Dude, that's going to be an inspiration for him. I know when I was 16 and, and coming up through this, if I would have seen a guy that was closer to my age doing it, that would have inspired me to work harder. And now we do see that through all the high school, through all the college. We have more youth coming into this sport. And, and the saddest part for me is the people that don't think that's a good thing. This sport will die. It will die without that. If if people aren't buying boats, if they aren't buying tackle, if they aren't buying the electronics, if they're not showing up for tournaments, all of this goes away. And the average age of bass fishing fans and bass fishing tournament fans in particular, but bass fishermen, it's 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 on up there, man. It is like the demographic is on up there. Uh, and I'm part of it being a 40 year old self. You know, I'm, a, I'm an old man these days, uh, but it does. It dies without the out this youth movement and man i don't i don't think it's a it's a bad thing uh to see what's going on now i do think uh it's amazing to me we saw this at toledo bend this weekend i saw this on social media if guys did not make the cut and some of these are friends of mine they made a post that said well i just went i tried to just go fishing and you can't go fishing and so they're feeding into that and so they have a lot of followers and things so people that's just kind of fueling the fire <clears throat> There was yeah. a question, Drew, that I wanted to get you right here. Uh, Eric says, does Drew think there's a limit to what technology should be allowed or is all technology good no matter what? I think that's a great question because there is a talk, you know, there's there's constant talk, I guess, about will they limit it? Will tournament trails mm -hmm. limit how many transducers you can have? First, yeah. before you answer this, how many transducers do you use? Got one. See, there you go. I said that the first of the show, guys. Um, but the thing is, like, that that is a question that I, I, I did with Pangrac, too. Um, when I look at that question, you know, in my opinion, I'm a one transducer guy. I like the ability, in my opinion, this is just a, a total side tangent that I could go off of for 15 minutes if I wanted to. I'm not going to. Modern mapping has changed fishing more than live scope for the last 10 years. You want to argue that fact, you want to get in the nitty gritty, it's not, it's not arguable. You take away modern mapping, it affects professional fishing more than forward-facing sonar. Modern mapping and the ability to use 2D sonar and understanding the geography and topography of fishery is the most important factor for finding fish. So me, most of the time, you know, I know guys are finding lots in specific scenarios like what we saw at Toledo uh, with, with multiple live scope transducers and things like that, but in my opinion, you're finding fish 90% of tournaments. You're finding fish using your topography, geography, skills of reading fisheries and understanding where they go at certain times of the year. I'm using forward-facing sonar to dial in exactly what and where I'm fishing in those specific areas. I'm not fishing an area because of what's there. I'm fishing an area because of how it sets up, and I'm fishing what's there because of the area. Um, so that's that's really why I'm a one transducer guy. But, like, you know, I'm I'm hesitant on – uh, things that limit technology only because like if I, I will put this caveat technology that affects the way that we do our job in terms of, of cognitive ability, meaning some sort of artificially intelligent technology, I think is kind of the line for me in any ability where the computer takes your ability and to understand away from you. Basically yeah. saying a computer, like if, if the software gets heightened enough where the software can tell you the, the size, species, and, you know, specific information about a fish to that extent, or like you know, any sort of software ability that basically can dial it in without you having to do it yourself, I think would kind of be the extent. But I mean, really, if you want to put 42 transducers on your boat, put 42 transducers on your boat. Having more than one only helps about, in, in my opinion, only has a great value 10% of the time. I'm not saying it doesn't have a value always because it does, but we're talking about marginal utility. Basically, marginal utility is every time I go up a unit in something, the value of that something goes down. The same thing with live scope transducers and units. The more units I have and the more transducers I step up, the less useful each one is individually because I'm physically not able as a human being to compute that level of information at one time. Um, but like, this is rounding back around what you're saying about the kids and the youth. This is something that really, for me personally, matters a lot because I see the one thing that gets me a lot of times, and it's, it was something that was very early on in this conversation, was people talking about forward-facing sonar omitting kids from getting into the sport because of an expense. 
as a college angler, as a Toyota angler, as an Invitationals angler, as a Bass Pro Tour angler, I have seen this play out lots and lots of times. You know how fast I burn through $2,500 fishing at a high level, traveling the country? Pretty quick. At an unbelievable rate. You know how long one single $2,500 investment for forward-facing sonar will last you? As long as, as long as you're willing to take care of it. And, you know, as, as a high schooler, I bought my first bass boat. It was an 01 Comanche uh, when I was a uh, junior in high school. I worked uh, at the grocery store and I mowed yards to pay for my boat. That was the same boat that everyone saw me fishing out of for most of the invitations. I remember. I remember the boat. Yep. Yeah, man. And I fished out of that boat for a long time. You know, uh, the, the coating of the boat, the gel coat totally beat off by the sun, whatever. And I, I was able to take the time and the effort and, and really focus my efforts on, on paying for that boat and making sure I was equipped in the proper way and paid for the forward-facing sonar because I knew as a high school angler that I started watching early on, watching these high schoolers practice with guides and go to these fisheries for a week because their dad could take off work for a week to go pre-practice for a tournament. A tournament with no payout, but regardless. They're, they're going and spending, you know, I started thinking about it. I was like, they're probably spending, you know, four to six thousand dollars per event on pre-practicing and guides and you you look at four to six thousand dollars per event let's say you fish eight tournaments in a season being unorganically good through those means would cost me 48 to sixty four thousand dollars twenty five hundred dollar investment and using it every time i got the opportunity to go whether it was through a high school tournament or just fun fishing within an hour of my house i was able to refine my ability to understand fish behavior with a $2,500 investment on top of what I was already spending to fish in a way that nobody that spent $60,000 a year on pre-practicing and guides without forward facing sonar could understand it. Because at the end of that, what do they have? A good tournament. At the end of that, you know what I have? The ability to understand fish behavior and repeat it. And over time, (laughs) tournament by tournament, I got closer and closer to catching those guys. Every event, I get a, a bite or two better every day. Bite or two better every day. And if you get a bite or two better every day for about three years, you get to the end of that, that rope and you realize that your decision in what direction to go was a good one. And, you know, a $2,500 investment is not, in modern bass fishing, is not a real blockade to the ability to compete at a high level. I don't care if you're putting it on a 10 ring that investment is worth more than $50,000 in pre-practicing, which is what would be required without forward-facing sonar to understand these places in a way that kids that grew up there fishing them since they were 10 years old understand them. That is what was my only way to truly bridge the gap was not just showing up and hoping, but understanding fish behavior. And for 2,500 bucks, I can understand fish behavior around the country at a base level. That- and that, that is the most invaluable thing in bass fishing. That is, uh, that talking about the high school tournaments and the guides and all that. And that's how you combated that instead of saying, cause I hear this a lot from high school anglers that I know, well, so-and-so gets a guide and I'll never compete. I love that mentality. I love the way you broke that down, man. Uh, there's so many positive comments in here for Drew Gill. Uh, absolutely amazing. Drew, uh, you're going to be around this deal for a while. I do want to ask you this. Because I've seen this a lot. Somebody, and, and I don't think this was someone being rude at all. Patrick's Patrick's a good fella. He's always in the comments. But is Drew confident enough? And I think I can answer that. This this young man, as I have, I'm going to be redundant here, is very dialed. But is Drew confident enough to compete on the Bass Pro Tour if forward-facing sonar wasn't allowed? So if they take it away tomorrow, are you just going to go home? <laughs> I, think, I think that's what everybody thinks every person that's that's great with forward facing sonar would do but what would you do if you get the call tomorrow hey drew we're no longer gonna allow this ever again what happens then i mean ultimately so with the knowledge base that you collect using forward facing sonar ultimately i'm confident that regardless of using the forward facing sonar in a tournament actively or not i can be on the upper end of the spectrum in, in high level bass fishing that's something i'm absolutely confident in Understanding fish behavior is understanding fish behavior. However, I will say without the ability to know the facts at all times, that is what makes unbeatable be unbeatable. And that is what is making the talent level of our greatest anglers look so dang beautiful on paper 
is because of how freaking good they are at reading what's going on around them. So yeah, absolutely. You know, you take it away. I feel confident enough in my understanding of fish behavior that I can compete at whatever level that you put me at. But man, using forward facing sonar is what is driving our understanding of bass fishing to the next echelon. And, and I'm going to be honest, we're, we're doing some crazy things on a lot of fisheries that like you look at what happened on Santee this week, who would have thought there was a population at Santee that lived the way it did. Justin Lucas, he swung the bat six times in the knockout round, caught 42 pounds worth of fish that weren't getting caught prior. Period. Mm. End of story. And Incredible. Unbelievable stuff. And, like, I mean, who doesn't love watching giant fish get caught? And who doesn't love watching more giant fish get caught now than ever? I mean, I, you I, watch that Toledo Bend event. If you can sit there watching Koya and Rob G and Patrick Walters and Schlapper just absolutely rail on five to seven pounders with a straight foot, straight face, you don't love bass fishing the way I love bass fishing. There's a lot of people that don't like it. There were a lot of comments. Oh, that they yeah. they, they would rather see 11 pounds get caught on the bank than eight pounders get caught offshore. But I, I, I never know. Uh, I never know what to think about those. I like seeing big ones get caught. I, I've said that about the forward facing sonar and the, and the, uh, you know, the St. Lawrence river events and things like that. And I've smallmouth fished up there so much that there are so many more bass over five pounds that get caught now because of it. I think yep. the coverage is amazing. People always gripe and complain. They don't like it, but, uh, just kind of where we're at, man. I, I, it, this is, uh, do you, someone says, do you like pickled quail eggs? Because Milliken <laughs> had those on camera yesterday. I don't know that I've ever had pickled quail eggs, so I can't <laughs> confirm or deny that doesn't sound good. That sounds kind of icky. Sounds but, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not, doesn't sound like my uh, cup of tea. I will say though, is as you know, in terms of the viewership aspect of people wanting to watch it, I think it's professional anglers, you know, obviously, with uh, bass and major league fishing, you know, they've started to try their best to integrate forward facing sonar and the imagery into the live. And you guys have as well with the NPFL. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I feel like is, is needs to become standardized and guys have to be open enough to, to talk about what they're doing. You know, that's always a goal of mine on live is to, you know, it, that was something that I took from, uh, from the first days I had on live was, was, you know, the first phone call that I had before going on live was, from Marty Stone, Marty telling me to be that I needed to be as educational as possible. And if I could be entertaining, by all means do it. And, you know, I, I try my best to be as educational, informational as possible because people are, tr are watching for those two reasons. They want to be entertained or they wanted to be educated. And if we can't do either, if we're just going to stand there in total silence and, and fish, yeah, big fish are going to get caught. That's awesome. But if we're not willing to talk through the way we're doing what we're doing, because I'm going to be honest, everyone say everyone, 80% of everyone that watches professional bass fishing that has a bass boat has this technology and they want to learn how to utilize it better on their fishery, regardless of whether their fishery is Toledo Bend or if it's Lake Shelbyville, two hours from my house. Like every, you know, I got, I've got people around the house all the time wanting to know how to use their technology better, but ultimately all they're ever watching in professional fishing is just watching people use it. They're not watching people explain what they're doing with this technology and the way that they use it. And like, ultimately Yes, our job as high-level anglers is to catch fish, but we have just as much of a responsibility to the fans making it an engaging place to uh, to go spend an afternoon. You know, I, I want people to spend their afternoon or their morning with us whenever they have the opportunity to, and anything I can do to improve that product to make it that way, I, I try to choose to do. So as anglers, I feel like we, we have a little bit of a responsibility to do a little bit better job with the product in terms of, of demonstrating what we're doing. But as far as that goes, like that's just a, a time and integration thing, you know, with time, that'll be standard. Well, I think you're doing a fantastic job, Drew Gill. And uh, I know the low lifers are proud just like I am that you joined us tonight. Go win West Point Lake. We, we won't, none of us will be surprised if that happens. Thank you so much, dude. We got to do this again soon. I could pick your brain for a very long time. Uh, the comments that they've been going crazy, man. And uh, I wish you the best of luck this year, buddy. I, I think uh, you're a bright spot in this sport, and you're going to be around for a long time. I appreciate you. It was a, it was a good time, and, you know, I'm always, always down to talk bass. And well, you can certainly do it about as good as anybody I've ever talked to on this show. Drew Gill, everybody. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, dude. Drew Gill right there, and now waiting in the wings. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them stacked up. We got them stacked up tonight. So we've got we've got the the 21 year old phenom right there, Drew Gill. Just gave us a a, a 
master's class on bass fishing, I feel like. And somebody else, somebody else that can give you a master's class on bass fishing, never shy on giving your their opinion. And, and you guys asked for this, and I made this happen for you lowlifers. The Drew Gill interview was fantastic. Absolutely. But I, I think we this could be the greatest episode of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me right now, the one and only fat Todd Castletine. There were so many fat Todd references in the comments at the first of the show around 630, Tad, that I had to get you in here. And I and you were gracious enough to stop whatever you were doing. And come hang out with the low lifer. So here we go. Low budget. <laughs> He's at a soccer game, ladies. I'm and at the soccer fields, man. It's practice. It's all right. <laughs> What's up, buddy? Nothing. I, I, I'm sorry about my expert lighting, but like I said, I was already here, and I'm like, but you know, what does it matter? Hey, they, don't I just, to, they don't need to look at all this. It's fine. Listen, I, I I shot you a link. I'm like, hey, jump in here. I don't know. I know you. I saw you pop up there. I, I was listening to Drew. I don't know how many times you've ever heard that young man talk, but he's pretty stinking impressive. <laughs> it's, I, I, it's I heard wild. him talk. So I, I met him at the the that the two championships. Um, okay. The last two Toyota champion or the the two the two we both made the top tens. He might have made it the last one. I don't even know. And then and then I saw him at Lake of the Ozarks as well. So I've got to visit with him a little bit here and there, and uh, yeah. He's got a, he's, he's, he's got some knowledge, uh, but you know, I always, you know, me, I always have like, Oh, here we well, go. Here we I go. Got, here we go. Know, here we go. You know, you know, Drew is here. I, I like me some Drew. I think Drew is going to be, I say one thing, you said it at the end, you're going to be here for a long time. He's going to be here for a very long time. Um, <laughs> for sure, dude. The one thing I'll say is, is when you're young, you have, when you're young, you think about one thing and one thing only as you should like just catch fish, right? You're just out there. You're just out there to catch fish. And that's really all you should think about as, as we've gotten older, me and you, we've seen the industry. <laughs> okay, you had to add me to the old part, but yeah. Oh, a hundred. Well, <laughs> <laughs> old is not the age it's just the how many years what see look we're old in our we're old because oh, we've, been, old, we've seen the industry old. for what it is and so we look at it through a different we look at it differently and i just look at it really different I, man i talked to like watson for like an hour and a half today about some Same. Things. Same. Uh, hey he was, should, you're filling in for Watson. So it was going to be Drew Gill Watson. Watson texted me about 15 minutes before. He's got some things going on, which I know you know about. And he said, I'm not going to do that tonight. I love you. We'll get caught up. But and he texted me, and then I called him, make sure everything's good. And, uh, yeah, so now we got we got Todd and Luke. But you talked to Jamesy today as well. I talked to James, and I talked to – and I hadn't talked to this guy in like a year or two. And I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, but like talk to Ronnie Moore today for like Big an Ron. hour and a half. Shout out Ron Dog. Yeah, man, we got into all kinds of stuff too. And so, uh, which man, I hadn't got to talk to him in a while, but I like talking to certain people about the industry and about different things. So, I mean, like I said, we all, we all, I like to talk to those guys because they always have my perspective, their perspective um, coming from a different way. Man, it's always good. It's always this is one thing I love about podcasts and what we do now, Luke, is that I think there's more information about what's really going on and like opens up some light to some people. And I like that more than anything. Just people getting to hear different opinions, right or wrong, just so they kind of get the full information. No, I, I think it's great. And 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 you and I have definitely we're not afraid to tell people what's what we feel is going on and and we speak I I We'd give a lot of opinions, Todd. You and I are, are great at opinions, but at the same time, we also lay a lot of facts out there <laughs> for people. You know that that people try to discredit some sometimes. We're we're both very lucky to have the uh, support systems that we do in our in our listeners and and viewers. Uh, but I have to ask you this, and I've only seen one comment about this tonight, and it really surprised me. Did you know 
that you and I, we are, and, and the and the Matt Pangrax of the world, we are trend-setting pioneers, as, as Fat Cat Newton likes to say, trailblazing, trend-setting pioneers. And Todd, joining the podcast ranks, joining the podcast ranks, Boyd Duckett. Boyd Duckett was like, you know what? I don't have enough going on. I'm the CEO of Major League Fishing. I am also a Bass Pro Tour competitor. I am also a sponsor, but now I'm going to also do a podcast so I can set the record straight on everything going on. Did you know that that was a thing? Because I found out today that was a thing. Yeah, so I found out today that was a thing. I was told to um, to watch it. I like if anyone knows, I might do YouTube, and I and there's pot. I rarely li- I've listened to. I'll, I've listened to your podcast before many times. Um, you're the only, you're basically the only one. I listened to uh, the podcast with, um, I, I got told by every, I did, I did some live deal one day and everyone said, Todd, go watch the one with the polygrapher from MLF. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, that I loved it. I loved that episode. I was very intrigued by it because I, I knew, it didn't, nothing surprised me. There was a couple of things that I didn't know, but not, I, when someone said, Hey, I'm like, Oh, is it going to be, they're like, man, everything you probably know, Todd, nothing will surprise you. And he was right. Yeah. Um, what I'll say is this, this is the part, I, this is the part I really want people to understand. And I think maybe we do set trends because of this loop. I, I will hold on to this and I don't care if people get tired of me saying this. When what we did five years ago, there wasn't many people who no one agreed with us. Very few agreed. Maybe they agreed or didn't agree, but very few people thought the way we did. We stood on our guns when we did it. If that's a saying, stood on, stand on our. You'd buy your guns, I think is the saying. Whatever. Close yeah. enough. We're I'm, cl- not, I'm, we're close I'm enough. not the smartest cat. So. You're we, no Drew Gill. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm no Drew Gill. Neither right? one of us are Drew Gill. But here's the deal. We did all that. We said a lot of things. And, and now I'm going to get to the point. We said a lot of things. We called out a lot of things that were going to happen. That they didn't happen yet. We're saying, this is what's going to happen, y'all. Get ready. <laughs> now, a lot of people would say, hey, y'all are trying to like tell the future. And we did. And no it happened. Ball, no crystal ball needed, but we did. No one, I, no one ever comes to us and goes, "Dude, y'all called it. Y'all didn't. Y'all didn't just get close. Y'all hit everything on the nail, and y'all said it before it happened. Y'all got called out for it. Y'all, it, it, it could have backfired on you completely, but it didn't. We've been doing that for five years now to the day, yet." Other like news outlets are great about just saying whatever they want to say, and not us. I'm talking about like like out there in the world. News outlets go off and saying all kinds of lies and saying things that are totally false. Every nothing bad happens to them. They just whatever. No one calls them out. We we don't have that ability. We don't have anyone backing us. We have to be right every single time, just about. And I'm not saying we're writing on our opinions, but we still, I mean, we did that. And all I'm going to say is when you, when you do that, we have hours and hours and hours of us saying stuff (laughs) at any point in time, someone can come back and go, Hey, Luke, Hey Todd, you remember when you said this, you were dead wrong. I fear that moment, but I'm not too worried about it because some of these things are very easy for us to see. So if you go out there and get you a podcast, buddy, and you're going to go say some things, by golly, get ready, because everything you say will be recorded and it will be used against you. Because I have no problem saying what I say, because I I think it's all going to I think we've been right every step of the way. So get ready because it can backfire on you. And I want to see what (laughs) You want to see backfires? You want to see FBD backfire fishing boat docks? I don't know. I don't, I'm not even talking about him. I, I mean, I'm just saying in general, you know, everyone wants to be all cautious. We're not cautious. We say things how they are. 
and how we think it's going to turn out. And when they do, we just kind of look back and go, huh. yeah, man, uh, you remember me in the back of the class saying all that? Okay. Well, and, and, and what was so funny, I remember, and I still get comments like that. Well, you're just a hater because you didn't catch them. And look, did I catch them as good as Todd Castledine? And will I ever? Absolutely freaking not. But I didn't quit tournament bass fishing with the FLW tour because I wasn't catching them. I'll assure you of that. I loved being out there. I had sponsors that, that I wasn't out of pocket for a lot of it. It was fantastic. I, we, I had a, we, we had we a, had a blast. Yeah, we had a blast, but we, listen, man, when all that started transpiring, it was like, hey, dude, we got to get off this mountain before the avalanche hits. And every single thing, now I won't say I've been right about everything, and I don't think you have been either at times, but you've also fessed up to it just like I will. But pretty much everything that we said has indeed happened. It has. And now and it's so funny to talk, and I know you talk to people all the time, like I do, that are there and they are living it within that organization that in 2019 were like, hey, man, you need to cool, calm down with this. You're wrong. And now they're like, dude, this sucks over here so bad. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Would you like to apologize at any point? No. To me? Zero apologies. <laughs> I've had zero apologies. And let me let me say this, too, from those guys. I'm pretty harsh about this. I don't feel bad. It, it, <laughs> listen, I know that's bad, but listen, if if you got shocked in any way, if there were guys like us, multiple people saying, be careful, man. Hey, look for this. Hey, do you see what I've had so many I've Not like a five minute. These aren't like conversations even on a podcast. These are like private convers conversations going, Hey man, like you don't, it's not even personal. It's a business decision. Look what's going on. Your interests are not prioritized at the top. I under it. And, and that's okay. Like no one says that you should be prioritized at the top of their interests. Like I'm not, I'm not prioritizing other people that have nothing to like my bottom line is my bottom line on what I do, but they're telling you that you're a priority. And I'm telling you right now, you are not one. And if for some reason you think you are, you are delusional. And now it's all coming back. And I'm like, Hey dude, this isn't, shouldn't be a shock. You were told this. We told y'all to look for this. And now it's like, now they're stuck. <laughs> dude that is the that's the you know in much respect to the guys that if that if you know they didn't appreciate what's going on out out of there over there that they put their money where their mouth was and they left and we've seen some of that this year you know and, and dude that's no easy row <laughs> to hoe either no. at all going trying to go back through the opens to get to the elites or coming to fish the mpfl like dude it's just not easy regardless of what your what your uh decision making process is there uh at all but but man, you're right. There are so many that you and I both talk to that will tell you that. Well, I don't know what else to do. Like here I am. I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, and you're, you're stuck and it's too late. I, so the, the new thing would happen. Uh, I didn't really ever go public. I, I kind of brought this up the other day, but at that Pickwick Championship, I'll never forget. I, I made the top 10 and I, I literally, I got my check. I got my check. I walk off stage, give some people from FLW some hugs. Like, hey, man, like, good to see y'all. Like, you know, people that, people that I, like, from F, and I say that not disturb, you know, I, they were FLW people. There's people I knew. And, oh, and so. Oh, no. Dark. Tad, uh, Tad didn't uh, have the light bill in his truck. Yeah. My, and so. His live scope drained his battery. <laughs> yeah. So I'll connect. So anyways, I'm sitting there and I walk off stage and, and you know, a comment was made to me and it was like, <laughs> it, it was. Hang on. I don't have your audio, Tad. Tad, we can't hear you. Can everybody hear Tad? 
Tad. He's just talking away. I don't hear anything he's saying. We can't hear you. No Tad. They're saying no Tad. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now. We got you back. Okay. okay. <laughs> Tad so is I think I, everybody's I, no I, audio. Tad, Tad, Tad. I love it. All right, he's back. Well, it, it connected to my truck, I think, when I started it to turn my lights. Boyd is so hacking like, LBL coming in hot. Somebody said Boyd is hacking LBL. Listen, if he was gonna do that, he would have done that a long time ago. <laughs> Maybe I'll just leave my truck running. Is that better? Yeah, that's fine. We well, can uh, hear you. You like live? Just keep talking. Yeah, just to, yeah, we're good. You're all good, dude. Yeah, we're live. Live, live. Every podcast needs signs to hold up to tell the other side when the sound goes okay. <laughs> Now he's going to get... You're okay, back. I'm, okay, now I'm you're back. back. I'm going to go to my truck. Okay. So... I don't know what you are. So, anyways, I where, where did I lead off? I don't know. I have no okay. idea. You just went quiet. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, did I talk about walking off the stage right at Pickwick? Yes, and you were getting uh, – somebody said something to you. I think I remember who it was, but continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was like, hey, I, I hope to see your credit card come through on Monday for the FLW tour or for, the, for whatever it was going to be the next year. And I was going – and it just hit me wrong, right? Like, I, it just hit it, something like, and I, I looked at him. I'm like, I walk, I walk, took a couple steps. I turned around, and I said, "Hey, you want to have a conversation about that?" And oh yeah, so we went and had a conversation. It got very, it got very heated because I was like, "All right, I got, I got some time to talk after this little tournament, but I don't really like where it's going." And I kind of expressed my views and all this stuff, and I'm like. And the entry fee is going to be how much? Fifty eight hundred. And I said, every time I, every year, it just seems like my entry fees keep going up. What's this extra eight hundred for? And I didn't know, but man, it couldn't have come at the worst time. He said, well, "That's to put a camera in your boat." I said, "Oh, really?" He said, "Yeah, we're going to have extra coverage, extra this, extra that, all this stuff. Eight hundred dollars a tournament extra for a camera." And I said, you mean like that camera I got today? And they said, well, I said, well, I was in the top five in the tournament. Y'all said, or top six, y'all said y'all are going to have six cameras in our boats pretty much all day long unless someone started catching them, like somewhere else. And I was like, but at 930, y'all took my, that camera away from my boat at 930 and left. And I know another guy who was not in the top six who got a camera put on their boat. And I was expecting them to come in with a giant bag. They caught one fish, but they had a camera in their boat for the rest of the day. So I'm supposed to pay $800 for that camera that I didn't even receive today. And I got to pay it for every tournament. So let me tell you something. I got a camera in my boat. Y'all made me pay for it back when I first started the tour. Loved it. Greatest decision y'all ever made me do. I had to go buy a camera. I'll get more views from that than I ever will from y'all. And I don't have to pay 800 bucks for it. <laughs> and... When that freak, when when this year at Toledo Bend showed up, and day one, there wasn't no coverage, and day two, there wasn't no coverage. Once again, I thought back, going, "Yeah, that's why I didn't fish the next year to pay eight hundred dollars for a camera that I would never see." And you're gonna uh, don't feed me that BS, man. Like I'll call you out on it, and I did, and apparently it got pretty. But I, I once again, I think I was pretty right about that. They now don't have coverage for day one and two. Which is a cost-saving measure. I've talked about that on here for sure. Okay, yeah. For sure. Day one coverage does suck, though, from the MPFL's perspective, from my perspective with the MPFL. Year one, we did it, and it's so hard to kind of pick who you need to cover because there's no standards, right? Like, it, that does suck, and I felt like – and we never did it again after year one. It was a cost-saving measure, A, but B – it does suck. But I felt like they did a great job on day one because that's the box they could move the camera around. Look, did you ask MPFL guys to pay eight hundred dollars more a tournament though for that coverage? No, 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 no. 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 So that's my point. I literally asked what the extra eight hundred bucks for. It was for it was for the camera, and I'm like, wait a minute, but I'm not getting the camera every time. So why am I paying for it? 
And so once again, I under, it's not the like coverage or no coverage. That's fine. But you just, once again, it was the same deal of like, everything keeps going up, but yet I don't think I'm going to receive that. I I was like, I don't need y'all's coverage. I make y'all, I got my own coverage. We'll be good. Hey, did uh, Fishing with Bam says they find James to get camera money. <laughs> <laughs> Poor James. Poor listen, James. Listen, I'll, I'll say, but I mean, I can't say a lot. Neither can you, unfortunately. No. We will. We will at some point. But there's shenanigans at play. And, and dude, I was told today, uh, and I think maybe somebody made a video about this too, but that like Boyd's significant other is making comments on anglers' pages. <laughs> like what? Dude, let me tell you something. It says some I what is that? So so listen, I don't know. But well, I kind of know, but listen, look, there is one thing I love, and 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 this is the best. And my, my wife, my wife's some she can't listen to half my podcast. Of course. Because if she did, she would be in the background shaking her head like this, going talk. And I'm like, it's fine. I do this all the time, but, but man, she is all like the, the putting stuff in writing is so funny to me because I always laugh that people like put stuff in, right. Like they don't realize that, you know, like people know how they like screenshot things. And like I said, we do this for, we do this on podcasts. So like you can record everything we say, we, we don't take any of this stuff down. You can go back and see anything we have to say and I'll stand behind it. But it, these people put stuff in writing and then on social media and then take it back down because they were, you know, emotional and put stuff. It, it's hilarious to me. And I was like, do you all realize that social to, to for us? And Luke, I know you're the same way. I, I don't think this is bad, but I don't live my life. And so, like social media cracks me up because like social media is more for my job and to goof around. I've never congratulated you on a tournament on social media. I've never done anything on social media to you other than make stupid comments on your social media. To hoping make to get, like, yeah, make it look like you hate me is what you do. And make me look like I hate you all the time. Any, all me- the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. And and, and there, there's great things because we can put little smiley faces like, ha ha, that was funny. Or we like it. And so people can go like, maybe those guys were joking, obviously, <laughs> because everything I put on, on Watson's page, your page is usually something stupid and dumb. And just to get a kick out of me, like I find it funny. And so I move on. But if I, if I wanted to congratulate you about something, I'll call you on the phone. Right. We got, we got into this big deal about like, you'll never see me congratulate people. I'm like, those are people I'm probably not friends with. Cause like, I'm gonna call you up and congratulate. I'm not going to post on social media, but these people that use social media to like go after someone like that, there yeah it's gonna be hilarious like it's comments and stuff like that are great because i screenshot all of them because they're funny to me and then i make videos on them well, which are also funny. i've really gotten into the uh the meme video making i'm having fun with that. <laughs> I, I, in my old age i'm like you know I, I'm, I i like being creative and i like being a smart aleck so it's perfect for me like i've learned how to do that that's my new genre, Todd. I'm I'm really like four last week. I don't even know who I'm becoming. Well, so I will say this: there is a there is a video on my TikTok page that if if anyone so like there is a video of me at night scaring a possum. Okay, <laughs> not twi- <laughs> it's not a dance work video. It's a possum video. Yeah, there's this little possum outside, and it's about a six second long video of me scaring a possum, and there's a face off between us, right? And then the video ends. And that's it. It's pretty, it's pretty whatever. But let me tell you something. <laughs> the comments I get from people, right, about how rude and mean this was to scare a possum. It's just scare it. Just I like I I like I like go, ah. And we and it takes off and then we face off and just look at each other and it's funny, right? <laughs> but let me tell you something: the joy that I shouldn't be doing this, but the joy I get from commenting back to these people, okay? <laughs> and the comments that I I am so I I never try to brag on myself about anything in life, fishing or any of that. Maybe I do, maybe I don't know. But I will brag you, upon this. You definitely do. Let me oh, okay. say right there. You definitely brag on yourself. 
<laughs> I'm your friend, so I can call you out. <laughs> yes, you definitely <laughs> brag. Okay, okay. Well, I'm. Bra- let me tell you, of all the things. <laughs> okay, of all the things I'm proud of, I'm telling you right now, the <laughs> comments I make to these people back in our exchange between each other, I love so much, and it, I have. It brings me such joy to like lead these people down this road it i am so pleased with myself and like i feel better about myself afterwards because it is so because i'm it's just awesome because uh, so here's a little i'll give you one little example they're like they'll be like that's rude as f or what you know that's rude blah 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 i'm like i know it is how dare that possum try to steal my cat's food you're right like and so they're like and so i turn everything against what they say and and they just Oh, it, they get so mad at how I respond to them, and I'm like, it, "It's great, it's it's so much fun." I'm just telling you, I have a blast. Brother Ben, Todd is amazing. I know that because he tells us all the time. I tell, I try to tell him all the time, you just listen. in case, in case, in case they forget. Todd, listen, Todd Castanheim. The first time I ever met him, and he probably doesn't even remember this many years ago. Oh, no, it's we, great. Yes, at, the, at Sam Rayburn at a McDonald's Big Bass Splash. He's just standing there. And Nicole Seeley, shout out to, to Nicole. She's like, hey, I want you to meet Todd Castledine. He's that like, was the first time? The first time I ever met you is years ago. Not, not the one we fished. Years ago. Oh, okay. Were hanging around working for a sponsor. And okay. I walked away going, that is the cockiest human being I've ever met. Because I didn't know if you actually called him or not. And then I found out very quickly that you backed it up. And I was like, okay, he can say whatever he wants to. He smashes on them all the time. But you're Dude. like, then I, then I pulled up on this bed and I caught a 12. And then I threw on this bed and I caught a nine. And then I threw an eight over here over my shoulder really easy with my abs. And I was like, who in the hell is this guy? Fat tag. Hey, man. Who it was? Just, just tell, one, I got one good compliment from a buddy of mine. He's like, man. I'll give you credit. I don't really think you lie, Todd, because all your I've heard this story seven times and it's never changed. And I'm like, and you get no. the, when you get the listen, listen, listen. This, story, this is my favorite Todd line. This is where you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you get me with, no, listen, listen. This is where you're wrong. So many times. <laughs> Man, you if you heard me and Russell, Uh-oh. me and Russell cannot wait. To disprove someone who's who's wrong, I will say that. Oh, I know. And I will, and he's the smartest guy I know, and so he's right a lot of times. But man, you don't mess up. We don't. You can't mess up with me or Russell because we will remember it and then call you out on it like six months later. That's right. That's exactly, so. exactly right. I agree. Both of you are are very similar. That uh, I got to give you a hard time on that though. It's funny. You're like I don't really. I don't know that I brag. I'm like. Hang on. Thanks, Paul Ted. Todd has great women in our lives that keep us kind of close to center. Without them, we would spiral out of control into the universe. The triple threat and Brittany keep us, even like he was saying, she doesn't watch his stuff. Marissa would not come on here tonight because she's heard some of the phone calls that have happened today. And she was like, I'm not getting on there tonight. <laughs> she's like, I know where this is headed. <laughs> Oh, we can talk about anything. It doesn't matter to me. Let me I got all kinds you, of good stuff. Let, let me ask you this. What is your take? And I know you've you've done videos on this, but but for some of the low lifers that might not watch the Todd video videos, and I think most of them do, judging by the comments. What's your take on I asked Drew Gill the same thing? The social media take on forward face and sonar. I want the Todd Castledine take. Uh, yeah. on, That's what I wanted to talk about. That's where I think that's where I think Drew Gill is um, is he's he's young and he doesn't need to worry about the take. He needs to worry about what he's doing and he's doing a good job of that. Of just catching them the way he's catching them and go freaking win a bunch and go do what he's doing. Like for him, it's irrelevant. He doesn't he doesn't need to fight that battle because it, it's it doesn't it's not going to benefit him one way or the other to fight that battle. What I'll say is this YouTube, YouTube is when I talked to Watts and I said, Hey, look, professional fishermen are the worst about staying in touch with reality. Okay. So 
And, and I make a lot of videos because I have no problem saying certain things because my background, if anyone wants to know, you can go look at my background and ask anyone around and go, yeah, I remember that guy fishing the Toyotas out of the oldest boat out there. Like the kid didn't come from money. He didn't do any of this stuff. I still don't have money. I'm still clawing my way fishing freaking weekend tournaments, right? I mean, I, I still fish with these guys. Like they know, they see me on the weekends. They know who I am. Like I, I'm not any different. I'm not like driving some jacked up truck with big my my big wrapped truck and boat. I don't have anything wrapped. I'm just out there, just like you. I, I look just like everyone else fishing. And cause I am, I am just like everyone else. I'm, I'm your everyday guy, but they get so out of touch. And when live scope came out and when people talk about it and I'll get into your question, but when people talk about it, they want to go. And I heard too many pros go, Hey, look, it's another tool. It's this and that and above all these things. And you're talking, like, no offense, we don't get our boats for free. But let me tell you something. A lot of guys are getting some of this stuff for at least half off, if not all the way off. Okay? So you're getting a product that you didn't pay for. And you're telling other people to go pay for that product. Now, we those guys have jobs. That product is going to benefit them and make them money. But they're asking a guy who's not making any money off of it to go spend full price for something just to catch a bass. For some people, that's okay. Okay. But some people have jobs that like they're trying to scrape by and they're treating it like it's no big deal, right? To go buy that. And you're like, well, it's only this much money. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, I go around to these tournaments and I see guys with pretty expensive bass boats that are six year old bass boats because they're not wanting to buy another one next year. And now you're not asking them to buy a bass boat, you're asking them to buy a bass boat with five electronics with power poles, with freaking uh, $1,500 batteries, and now a live scope and possibly two. And so I just think people are out of touch with like the, the guy going, hey, man, I'm just trying to get out there and figure out how to pay for some gas and do this and not like just like so my wife doesn't divorce me while I'm out there spending money. And so I just think that they get very out of touch with, with reality. What I'll say about the fishing side of it is, is like, I do think it, when, when those guys speak, you need to listen to them. When those guys are making comments on our YouTube, if you just say live scope is cheating, I'm not listening to you. Right. I could care less what you have to say. But when we get comments that go, Hey man, I've been fishing this way for a long time and I tried watching it and man, it was really hard on me because I kind of want to see this. I kind of like, and, and they give a long thought out explanation of why they don't like it. Well, you, if, if you're not listening to that guy, then, then you're something's wrong. Cause you should be listening to that guy. That guy's telling you his heart felt thought about what he thinks about it and that he doesn't like it. And so if you ignore that, I think you're doing a disservice to ignoring those people who don't like it. I love bed fishing. I love sight fishing. It's my favorite thing to do. I do it 36, 365 days a year if I could. I don't make videos on it because watching me flip to the same spot over and over again and you can't see the fish, if you were in the boat with me and anyone that's ever been with me thinks it's the most fun fishing they've ever done and they've never done it before, they love it. But they don't. But on camera, it sucks. It's not fun. It's not great to watch. Live scope can be that way. And I heard Drew Gill talk about um, like catching giants, like on a spinning rod and stuff like that. And, and yes, it's kind of fun. Wa it's fun watching it. It's not fun watching 10 guys do it the same way. And I don't, th I think that they all should be doing that. That's the way to win. I'm not like do whatever you need to do to win. However, at some point in time, if you gave the same guy a chance to go catch 75 fish, going down the bank on a plopper, uh, which one do you think is more fun? To do or to watch. Both would be more fun. But Both. Both but, would be fun to watch. But so, I it's to me, like, when you watch, back in the day, we got to watch different guys do different things on live. Right now, what we're watching is the same guys doing the same thing to the degree. They're catching big ones 
but they're not no one's learning i'm sorry you're not learning and here's why if when you watch and i don't want to throw this out there but my alabama waters i loved making that video because it showed the it showed the light go off in my head when i started catching them on a boat dock and my entire day changed and i started running this thing and catching them like you got to see the change happen you get to see we got to see when a guy figured out something on a frog or got to see something and it figured out and they got to watch the process move along and you got to see it happen. Like the, you're, it's hard to see that with live scope because you're kind of wandering around and the fish are out there suspended and you kind of just see that it, it is like, I'm not knocking it, dude. I love doing it. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying there is an issue in my opinion, watching it live. It's, 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 I think it does get to be monotonous not boring but monotonous i think that what hurts it the most and watson i actually talked about this today what hurts it the most from a viewership standpoint and i again i watch more hours of this than just about anybody watching mpfl you know five six hours at a time uh is the fact that it does seem that all we are doing now is jig head men over jerk right yes you, yes. you, you rarely see a guy pick up something that you're like holy crap that's how he was catching those suspicious yes. there's there's not a mind-blowing thing that's happening and, and and i think if you had 10 guys doing it and they were all approaching it with a different lure right correct yes you wouldn't have the same you wouldn't have the same number of complaints so that it that is a real problem from a coverage standpoint yeah uh, you know i would listen i'll tell you right now uh, and I like to give the people in the comments a hard time. I, I have fun with that. But like at Logan Martin, the MPFL, we had some live scoping going on, on the top end. We had some cranking going on. It was a really diverse top end. And, dude, I was grateful for it because we got to see – we can see yes. all the cameras in the studio. I got to see a lot of different things going down. So I get it from a viewership thing. What I don't like, though, is some of the things we talked about with Drew Gill is, well, all you got to do is have live scope to catch them. You know, like I do, that ain't the case. No. Uh, if that wasn't if that wasn't the case, you wouldn't have pros that don't make the cut making videos about how live scope needs to be banned. <laughs> no, and, <laughs> no. So live scope is like I spent, you know, I, I I've pretty been under wraps about doing it. Um, I, you know, I don't make a lot of videos about it. I don't do. I, I talk about it, but what I'll say is this: because I'm not going to get into the like I can do it. Uh, I've done it a lot. Um, I have to because um, I, I, I jumped on it really quick when I'm like, I'm not going to let these boys around my house beat me. Like, I don't have that luxury. Like, I have to make some money. And, uh, you know, so I, I'll i jump on board with any of it, man, to, like, figure it. Like, we're just going to learn. Like, I, it's a great learning thing. But, man, I just don't – I don't like the whole – like, it's not always easy. There's a lot of things that go go on with it. And what happens is, it's like any tournament. It looks like it, and it is the dominant force right now. It's the dominant force because there's that many guys doing it. So before it was kind of hit or miss because you only had, you know, a quarter of the field doing it. Well, now you're getting like half the field. So like, it, it's like any, if you had half the field cranking, right? Then all of a sudden you might look up and see, you know, seven of the top ten cranking because that's what everyone was like doing to win and so i i think now I, I will say this luke and i'm not bashful about saying this and i can say this and and i don't have a problem the one thing i'll disagree with when people try to defend is the fact of if you took live scope away and i'm not talking about the exceptions i'm talking about in general there would be guys that would struggle tremendously and you can't get bad about this comment, and here's why. Some of those same guys openly have said, I haven't caught a fish other than live scoping in two to three years. And so if they say that, like, there's a good chance they wouldn't catch them as good when they've caught 100% of their fish over the last three years doing it. But, but. This is this is my devil's advocate to that. I think that's an unfair statement to make. You know why? Because it's allowed, and we can do it, and they can do no. it. No. But it's I no just said if they took it away. 
that those conversations and the comments are like LeBron versus Jordan. Who's better? Well, we don't know because they didn't play against each other. You don't know. No, no, no. I, well, no. What, what I'll say is, is I no. I mean, there's if listen, fishing is fishing is hard, and if you took. Yeah. If you took certain things away, like, dude, if you took sight fishing away from me in the springtime, I wouldn't be as dominant. I have no problem saying yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, okay, if you took a plopper away from James Watson, it, there, he would. Still, he just did good. He didn't use a plopper. But it, we were shot with all that, shots that he didn't use a plopper. <laughs> yeah, like we do. Like there were things that you did good, right? And there's and if you took that away from you, you wouldn't be as good. It, it's not a knock. I don't know why they, they say it's a knock. Like I, I have no problem saying that I can catch in the springtime. I've won tournaments in the springtime, not sight fishing. But by golly, sight fishing was my bread and butter. And if you took it away from me, I would struggle at times. I, I wouldn't be – I could catch a fish, but I think you would see the dominance factor in some of them. Because, listen, it happened with the Alabama rig on tour, and I got in a big argument with somebody, and I'm like, look, dude, these guys never did good. And all of a sudden they did good, and then Alabama rig went away, and they went back to where they normally like fish. Guys grew up with live scope. I'm just saying I don't think they should take it away. But if you took it away, it's some of the only things that they learn how to do. It it's not a knock. It's just it's it can't be a knock when it's a fact. No, I, I think it's, no, no, I, I know that, and I know, wasn't like that was just the devil's advocate. Now I've got people arguing in the comments about Jordan and LeBron, and it's my favorite. Uh, yeah. but I'm these, the these theoretical statements that people make, well, if you took it away, and look, I agree that this younger generation, I just heard it from Drew Gill. He said in high school he saved up money cutting grass to go buy one because he was trying to figure out how to beat kids that were fishing with guides. He's like, if that's going to make me better, yeah. I'm going to do 100%. it. And so that's what he's invested his entire young fishing career yeah. into. So, dude, so it's, I, it's available to them. They're great at it. And, and do it's it. not allowed, buddy. It's only going to keep – they're just going to keep beating the brakes out of people that refuse to use it because they're only going to figure out more ways that it makes them that much better. It, here's – here's and, and listen, I got into some conversation with some guys that just live scope. Young kid, like college kids. Like I know them, friends with them. Like I, and I said, hey, man, just be careful. Because don't let some don't let some of these guys that are, that have a little bit of age on you learn live scope. I was like, because then they get good at live scope, and then they have the knowledge of the last ten years of of other stuff too. Like, like on Rayburn, I have some like areas that like you give me a live scope in that area. Oh, you're in trouble. You don't know that area because you right like because we have history there. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm learning how to how uh, learning how to use live scope. There's levels to it. That's why I, I think Drew's really I think Drew's got an upper hand on a lot of people. And because I, I kind of I compare it to sight fishing. I've talked to you about this. What I talk when I talk about sight fishing, it's a it's a different level in the fact of it's not about being able to catch a fish off of a bed. Anyone can make one cast to a fish on a bed, the right fish, and a bite. And then there's like catching fish for fun off beds. And then there's like, you know, catching fish in tournaments off beds. And then there's winning a tournament bed fishing and finding a fish that no one else finds on the entire lake or one that no one can catch. Like that's how you win a tournament. Or 15 that nobody else finds, right? 15. Or 15, right? 15. And so I, 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 when I like, when I started live scoping, I'm like, okay, I figured out how to go catch fish off live scope. And then I was like, man, I'm not figuring out how to catch big ones off live scope. And then all of a sudden that started happening, but none of that translated to a tournament really, you know, and, and that's, there's those levels of trying to figure out how to take all that and then win a tournament doing it. The levels to that are extremely high. So when someone's like, oh, I know how to live scope. I was always saying, I know how to catch fish off live scope. I don't know how to win off live scope. And I know there are guys out there that know way more about it than I do. And I have to figure out how to get to that level. And I'm nowhere near that level. And I, and I'm, I acknowledge that Drew's to that level. And, and so like 
there's a different level to, and if someone thinks that they're that they're on his level they're wrong they're just <laughs> they're wrong because I listen, he's good at it i listen to that dude for 45 minutes and i think just the way what he's learned what he's absorbed dude he, yes he's a scary young man and will be for years to come even if you take it away dude like he's it's pretty crazy. Well, that that's the other thing. Blew my mind. The other thing I'll say is is like you know, we also used to talk about how some of these young guys are coming in and how we would have to like go through these trials of like no, no one no one showed me anything in fishing for like 20 years, right? And then YouTube kind of popped up and people can like learn things off YouTube really really quick. Yeah. And 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 it, it's what like me and Hallman used to talk about that. Like, man, the learning curve is shortened. Well, let me tell you something. And I always laughed about this too. I always laughed when people would sit there and tell me what fish were doing. Um, like, so I got these fish down here doing this and I'm catching them this way. Like pros were, I'd be like, I wonder if that's true. It sounds good. And now magazine speak, right? Magazine. Right. And, magazine speak, yeah. and, they, and they weren't being, they weren't trying to be like, like super intelligent, like, Hey, I know more than you. They really thought that. And so did we. And then live scope came around. I'm like, golly, everyone was wrong. We were so wrong. It's hilarious how wrong everyone was. Everyone, hundred percent of the people were all wrong. And those guys are like, those guys got like, no, they got all the truth. They're looking at live scope and they're like, I don't really care what all y'all said. I'm seeing what they're doing. No doubt. And so they have learned and like the other day we, when me and Russell were on Conroe this past weekend, of course you can't see some stuff up shallow and we got to like power fish them. Right. And in our conversation was, are these fish there? Cause everyone was like power pulled down, like casting in the same spot. And we're like, are they there? Or are they moving through? And with, with live scope and the way it was all set, you can't see them. Like you can't do any of this. It was shallow and none of it. It was, we still don't know. Right. Anywhere else, if we could have seen them, but we were sitting there going yeah we still don't know now we don't know if they were there or and they finally decide to bite or if they're swimming through and they're moving to us because but it's funny like those guys those guys know what's going on damn right they do i love this comment and this is a weird username chad sabota 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 one or something could jacob wheeler win without ford facing sonar dustin connell i would say no buddy they won everything before they had it. so yeah, they've won. They've won elite series. They've won four Swift Cups, BFL All Americans. Like, dude, Jacob Wheeler's won everything in the sport twice at this point, other than the classic before uh, four facing sonar and I, I hate exceptions. Yeah. Exceptions kill me. I'm like, look, guys, I'm not. When I make that comment, it's like that some guys would struggle. Not the guys who were already good with it. Oh, I'm talking yeah. about I'm talking about the guys that you're like, I've never seen that guy do anything other than live scope. I personally think he would or the guy didn't really ever catch him. And all of a sudden, miraculously, like three, three, four years ago, they all of a sudden started like they've been in the game for seven years, never really caught him. And then all of a sudden they just started catching them now. And when you see him, all they do is live scope. I'm just saying live scope kind of made that transition for him to where they caught him. I'm not knocking it. And if someone's getting upset about that, it probably applies to you. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, it is what, don't be ashamed of it. I'm just, I'm just saying, but guys like Jacob Wheeler and them guy, if anyone th makes that argument, those guys were catching them way before. It's just made them better. Dude, Dustin, all it was, Dustin was catching them when he was freaking 18 all over the state of Alabama. He's winning everything. Trophies all in the backseat of his yeah. truck. He's been around. I mean, and, but here's the thing. He picked, it's like Jordan Lee. You see Jordan Lee with the forward face and stuff. These guys are freaking unbelievable with it or without it. Like, understand yeah. that. Like Todd Castle yeah, okay. is great with it or without it. Like understand that he sees the value in it at times. Yes. And understand all of these guys, most of them, most of these guys will be dangerous regardless. Now, right. now let me tell you, let me tell you something. See, because people are afraid. Like I might brag. Okay, say I brag every once in a while, but like, <laughs> like you know, every blue moon. That's the second lie you've told. I'm going to blow. This is the Todd Castle down lie sound right here. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so like, 
I've been told I brag like once a year. Now, yeah. I have no problem saying, right, I'll do the opposite too. Like, I'll tell you when I will, I have no problem telling you when I will struggle. You take, I hated January and February on Rayburn because, uh, and we won some tournaments those times of years, right, with some giant bags. And I knew how to do it. But besides the fact of like, like, I didn't like having to like spend weeks upon weeks looking for a spot like that that can be taken away from you in an instant from someone watching you and like all those weeks of hard work are gone. That's why I really stopped trying to fish that way because it was not worth it um, just to win one tournament. But I, there was only w- one way to win a tournament and it was so much work and like it could all be taken away from you in an instant that it I was going to quit fishing. Like I, it was not worth it. I was going to lose my mind having to deal with that kind of stuff. But I was not, I would zero in those, like I was scared to catch a limit because it was hard on Rayburn and Toledo or Rayburn to fish that way and try to win a tournament. And if you didn't fish that way, it felt like you were like, well, I'm, I'm out here just like trying to do okay and maybe get a check in the grass or do this or do, do whatever it was. Right. And it became hard. I don't worry about a limit ever again in January or February, ever, ever. And if you took five people away, I would go right back to worrying about it because I, because I know where the fish are and you can't catch those fish without it. You can't, it's impossible. So it, I have no problem saying that, that like I would, it, it would, I only want live scope for at least those two months, so I don't struggle so bad in those two months at times. Do you want to know one of the most? You you brought up January and February, and this just triggered my ADD mind. And we're gonna to have to wrap it up because we've been like two. I've been going two hours straight. <laughs> this is the longest LBL ever. And you're watching. You're watching your your. No, pra- practice is done at eight thirty, so we're you're good. Almost done. You're almost done. So, but I had live scope on my boot when we fished the January tournament where we all sucked <laughs> on Rayburn and the water was high, but I had it. Like I had it then I had had it for a year. I never even looked at it. I never even, you, looked, I never even you, thought about looking at it. You would have smashed them, Luke. But a bunch of us had it and nobody was paying it any attention. Nobody. And back then those stupid fish out there, were so dumb because like they've never seen a beta. I mean, you could have thrown freaking a rooster tail, little George, or you could have thrown anything. They're like, Hey, what's that thing out here floating around? I'll go get that. That you would, because now you kind of get a little bit, you kind of like got to trick them a little bit at times, but man, and, and it's not too hard at Rayburn and Toledo because they're so big. It's just hard to cover that many fish. So it, it, they're not, I've been to table rock. Let me tell you something. Those fish ain't exactly easy. I mean, you, you get some places where they get, but Rayburn Toledo fish, that those places are so big. You find fish that still ain't seen a bait in a while, you know? Oh yeah. But yeah, you look, you would have smashed them if you'd have just gone, Hey, what's that? Di- what's that big old bright thing out there? What's this? Is throw so at stupid. It. This is what's so stupid about me is the year before I had regular pan optics when we were at Lake Lanier 2018 and I caught them off of it. <laughs> On the regular, the original. Then halfway through that year, I got live scope because I did the live scope launch at ICAST with Garmin. I had it on my boat <laughs> for the entire 2019 season. I don't think I caught a bass off of it. Not one. I don't know that I ever even turned the damn thing on. And I had it. I had it right. Yeah. There. Stupid. I, I I remember that. I remember when I had it, and we, or when I, the, I think the first time I had it when I borrowed a boat. Um, I borrowed a boat at a Bassmaster Open on Cherokee, and um, <laughs> it was like my dealer's boat, and he had it on there, and I was kind of looking around at it going, I don't know what, and there was this rock, and I threw my drop shot down there, and it bit, this fish bit beside it, and I'm like, I'm like, that's awesome. So I fished the entire tournament, you know, do everything, and I had like four fish on day, the second day, I did horrible on day one, and, and I had like four big giant smallmouth or something on day two, and I'm like, you know what? I know where that rock is over there. And I went over there to that rock and I threw my little drop shot down there and boom. And, and I remember Hallman going, 
this live scope thing is going to be good for us because it's going to probably catch us one extra fish a tournament. <laughs> and I and I was like, dude, you're right. It, it, it that's it's exactly what it's going to do. No, it can catch you like 40, 50. But <laughs> oh my goodness. Todd Castledown, I appreciate you, buddy. Short notice came through. You and I, we're gonna we're gonna do uh we need to, I need to return to the river. I'll come to the Castle Dine channel. We've been talking about it. Yeah. Do a live. We'll we'll wait. We'll wait. Cause like we'll we'll uh we'll the, the great thing about the fishing industry right now, we don't have to wait too long. Something will pop up. <laughs> That's a fact. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There Something are, will pop up. Things on the horizon, Tad. Yeah, <laughs> then me and you. Will, yeah, me and you will look up and go. I think it's time, Luke, and be like, I think it is. There are things a brewing out there, unfortunately, yeah. it like tonight. So, all right, buddy, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop you off here, and I'm gonna talk to the low lifers for a second, and send them out. I appreciate you, buddy. Everybody, go follow Todd Castle on fishing if you're already not. I'm looking at the comments. I think all of you are. But uh, there's 425,000 people in here right now, Tad. Dude, dude, your fan base is freaking awesome. Those low lifers, like they're freaking awesome. The low lifers are the best. They are indeed the best. Do you call? Before I let you go, do you call your fan base anything? Are they the tatters? The tatters? No, I, I haven't done any of that. Like, I, no, I'm just glad that they even halfway listen. Yeah, me you too. Because I, I talk in circles. Apparently, I do all kinds of things I didn't know I did. They call they call me out and let me know what I do wrong. So it's great, hey, dude. Same and I, and, I love it. And yeah, it did, like and now I'm like, hey, I'm talking in circles. I had Zona on the other day, and Zona, Zona did worse than me about talking in circles. I was like, he's good. I followed, I followed him. I'm like, I didn't know you did that. I I follow you perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, Zona's like you and I, squirrel. He'll, yeah. Hey, what's over there? Hey. We're going to the rabbit hole for sure. All right, All right. Tyler, I appreciate you, buddy. Tell Brittany I said hey. All right, tell her hey, thanks for having me on. See y'all guys. Absolutely, buddy. Todd Castledine, everybody. We appreciate the one and only Fat Tad joining in. I think all y'all, man, we had a great crowd tonight the entire time. This was so much fun. And I know I say this every time I do a live. I really do mean really do mean to do more lives. And I am getting to a place in life where I can. I've got a lot going on, a lot going on. Like the Bassmaster Classic live party coming up. If you are going to be there, we're going to do a live, 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 live at the Hunt Club is what it's called. <laughs> uh, after two hours of a podcast, I'm uh, brain dead. So we're going to uh, kick things off there at seven o'clock, a live podcast. We're going to be playing music. I have a band put together to jam out with, with some very special guests. It's going to be a fun night. If you were there in Knoxville last year, you certainly understand uh, it can be a fantastic time. So y'all come on out. If you're going to be in Tulsa, I got some big announcements I'm going to be making that night about kind of where my future's headed on a lot of things. Life is good, ladies and gentlemen, you low lifers. I appreciate each and every one of you tuning in. I really appreciate Drew Gill. Y'all go follow that young man. Uh, he's texted me tonight since he since he left the show thanking the low lifers thanking me for having him on such a great 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 guys great great guest great young man there and uh always todd man absolutely coming in clutch since mr james worldwide watson couldn't join us tonight as planned todd filled in absolutely enjoyed that so glad so many of y'all did looking forward to uh the year, man. Everything. Life is good. Like I said, life is good. Uh, Raj Bash, you're the man. You had some great comments tonight, brother. I appreciate y'all. Sorry we didn't get to all the comments. I was trying. I, it, when, next time I do live, I need somebody almost to moderate some of this so we get some of these good, good, good ones in here to the guests. But I appreciate y'all hanging. I'm going to take you out with Biloxi Blues. And I am going to see y'all next week for a not-so-live regular old regular not so live thank y'all see you have a good week from jackson town to tupelo i never could make it last spanish moss a civil war ghost well i'm gonna leave them in the past